Good afternoon. Uh, welcome. My name is Patty Sophus, and I am going to be presenting this fake news as disinformation workshop. Um, we'll be looking at strategies for evaluating the news. And I um, have lots of information prepared for you, so we're just going to go ahead and get started. One note, if you have a question, um, please uh, type it into the chat. I'm doing this workshop on my own, so I'm not able to respond immediately, but at the end of the presentation, I will answer as many questions as I can. So let's get started. So in this workshop, we're going to look at definitions, um, meaning what are we talking about? Um, we'll look at players and mechanics of the news ecosystem. Where are the news readers in this ecosystem? And we'll look at how to detect and decipher disinformation. So what is news? News is information about recent events deemed to be interesting, important, or unusual enough to be newsworthy. That is gathered, verified, and structured in accordance with journalistic norms before being published in media, ranging from newspapers to live blogs. I want you to notice that this definition is very explicit about the process that is used to create news. So news and democracy, why is this important? Shared knowledge is required for public discourse about politics and society. And disinformation is eroding trust in media and other information sources, which is where we get our shared knowledge. These are examples of types of disinformation that could occur as part of our election cycle, including things like deep fake videos or phony memes on Instagram and domestically generated distortions, as well as digital voter suppression. And this report was published a year ago, and it was actually directed to how the social media industry should prepare for these types of disinformation attacks. So where do you go to get the news? Uh, do you go to links on social media? Note that social media is a gateway to news and not a news publisher. Do you get information from more than one source or type of, of sources? For example, there are news aggregators like Google News and Apple News. Um, do you go to specific newspapers and read those news articles? Or maybe um, the op-eds or opinions and editorials in the newspapers. Then you might be going to news broadcasts or talk radio. Whatever your news habits are, you should know the hallmarks of quality journalism. Here are some essential features of quality journalism. Uh, I want to point out that when professional journalists make an error, they are expected to retract, uh, correct, and or apologize. And professional journalists should correct errors quickly. So the Society of Professional Journalists has uh, a code of ethics, and I'm going to take us out to a website now quickly to that uh, society's website so we can just look at the code of ethics. And so, you know, journalism is a profession and they're um, guided by um, the code of ethics. So it includes seeking truth and reporting it, minimizing harm, acting independently, and being accountable and transparent. And I don't have time to go through all of these things. And the main thing is to know that, that these ethical um, guidelines exist. And hopefully at some point, if you're interested, you can go back and take a look at them. So let's go back. To our PowerPoint. Okay, so All Sides um, is an organization and they have a methodology for rating bias of media outlets on a political spectrum from left to right. So 
This chart represents the average view of individuals surveyed about each publication. And if we define bias as a point of view or perspective, then all news outlets are biased. But this does not mean that the content is false. The human tendency is to dismiss sources that have a bias different from our own bias, also known as confirmation bias. But we should evaluate the reliability of a publication separately from its bias. Uh, political bias is not inherently wrong or bad. Uh, political bias can sometimes be falsely accused as being fake news. Let me show you the All Sides website where they show some current news stories from across the political spectrum. Well, let's see. We've got uh, election coverage, competitive Senate races. From the center, we have CNBC. Uh, from the right, we have CBN. And from the left, CNN. So these are different perspectives on this news story. And I think this is really useful um, if you're interested in getting different points of view uh, to understand the differences and similarities. So we're going back now to Take a look. So just because you agree with what, you know, a perspective um, does not make mean it's right or wrong or fake news or credible news. And, you know, we do um, tend to have that confirmation bias. Uh, in 2018, the Pew Research Center survey indicated that Americans tend to label statements they agree with as factual and those they disagree with as opinion. And also a 2019 study by Ohio State University psychologists suggests that people do draw a distinction between dishonest and biased sources. The researchers found that even accurate news when reported by a source considered biased tends to lose its credibility. Now, this is a media bias chart also, and this is by Ad Fontes Media. It also shows bias from left to right political perspectives, but this chart adds the vertical dimension to show a reliability ranking or ranking. Um, this gives a framework for evaluating reliability separately from bias. The Y axis here um, ranges from original fact reporting at the top down to contains inaccurate fabricated information at the bottom. So we can see at the top and um, we have the AP and Reuters news service um, and they're more most reliable doing original fact reporting. Um, fact, general fact reporting, we have tons of publications here um, that are reliable, reliably doing fact reporting. And at the bottom, we show the National Enquirer and World Truth TV, which um, contain inaccurate fabricated information and are therefore less, um, completely unreliable actually. Okay, so uh, lots of scholars have been studying this phenomenon of disinformation and one scholar, Melissa Zimdars of Merrimack College, has identified types of websites containing suspicious information, including, including those that purposely fabricate information or distort news. They present opinions as fact, rely on disproven conspiracy theories, traffic in unverified claims, consist of state-sponsored propaganda, promote racism, misogyny, or homophobia, or use exaggerated or misleading headlines or images as clickbait. So what is fake news? Media experts define fake news as factually false information delivered in the context of a supposedly true news story that is deliberately designed to deceive readers or viewers. It's a compact definition. 
These are different types of misinformation that can be weaponized into fake news. Satire, propaganda, clickbait, conspiracy theory, misleading, or out of context information. And what they all have in common is that they are uh, containing fabrications um, and packaged as legitimate news stories. So why is the term fake news problematic? Scholars have described three ways in which the term fake news is used. It can imply a genre of disinformation online. It can be used by critical political actors as a label to delegitimize news media. And it can also be used to simply dismiss something as negative or false. These variant usages of the phrase fake news make the term less precise and scholars have moved away from this term. The dismissive usages of the term fake news are particularly problematic because they do not leave room for critically evaluating a source or its message, which can lead to gaps in understanding of consequential information. The distinction between misinformation and disinformation has a critical impact on public understanding of fake news. So misinformation typically describes falsehoods of fact that are spread either purposely or accidentally. Disinformation, on the other hand, always refers to information specifically designed to mislead or deceive consumers, to influence their attitudes, beliefs, or behaviors. Thus, fake news is disinformation, not misinformation. Claire Wardle is a scholar who recommends against using the phrase fake news. In her own work, she recommends three nuanced definitions. I won't be going through all these distinctions today, but this precision can be helpful when you are evaluating content for reliability. The low to high spectrum characterizes the degree of intent to deceive. So for example, satire or parody, no intention to cause harm, but has the potential to fool. Um, and Contrast that with the high uh, uh, intent to deceive, fabricated content, new content that is 100% false, designed to deceive and do harm. Social media platforms such as Facebook have a dramatically different structure than previous media technologies. Content can be relayed among users with no significant third party filtering, fact checking, or editorial judgment. An individual user with no track record or reputation can in some cases reach as many readers as Fox News, CNN, or the New York Times. My friend posted it and that's good enough for me. The average American with access to the internet consumes a large portion of, of news through social media and 68% of us get our news or some or most of our news this way. Social media platforms are not news publishers, remember, they serve as gateways to news. Content. So there are algorithms at work here in our news feeds. Social media platforms have more control than you may realize over your news feed. Their algorithms or computer programs are designed to increase your engagement in the form of likes, shares, and comments. An algorithm will promote disinformation and misinformation as readily as it promotes legitimate news, as long as it engages us. Why is it set up this way? Social media platforms want you to engage with their platforms to show you as many ads as possible. News sites, both credible and untrustworthy, are funded in part by ads. Ad brokers want to place ads and advertisers have limited controls over where their ads are shown. In order to survive, mainstream media outlets have had to encourage sharing of their content on social media. Publishers are dependent on a lot of their readers coming from social media. I want to show you a video that explains how this works with a real example from 2016. So we have to go out of the PowerPoint for a moment. A 
At the start of 2016, in a small town called Bellas in Macedonia, an 18-year-old high school student discovered that he could make more money than his parents by building fake news sites. To protect his identity, we'll call him Boris. And here's how he did it. He wrote tons of false articles about the US election, most of them salacious. The articles were shared on Facebook, garnering tons of traffic. So much so that Boris's most popular website earned him $16,000 over the course of a few months. That's way higher than the average monthly salary in Macedonia, which is $371. So Boris dropped out of high school and he was not alone. In the final weeks of the election, there were more than 100 political websites registered to Bellis. The most popular stories were pro-Trump, but that's not because Boris and his fake news publishers liked the candidate. They just liked the money. Trump supporters just happened to be more likely to share fake news. Researchers tracked 30 million shares of pro-Trump stories on Facebook in the months before the election. But why were companies advertising on fake news sites? They weren't directly. Those ads were placed by services like Google AdSense or AppNexus, which act as intermediaries between advertisers and small-time publishers like Boris. They negotiate how much ads cost and manage payments from advertisers to publishers. Those ads follow people wherever they go online. Remember when you recently searched for that onesie? Well, that search was tracked and matched with advertisers selling that product. So everywhere you go on the web, a onesie ad follows. Advertisers and these services create blacklists of sites they won't advertise against, but it's hard to keep up. So sometimes they pop up on fake news sites that haven't been discovered yet. While Boris and his friends were making money, fake news became one of the major scandals of the 2016 elections. Many wondered if sites like Boris's even helped Trump win. A joint study by NYU and Stanford University found that it may not have tipped the election as much as one would think. It found that one fake news story would need to be as persuasive as 36 TV commercials to swing a voter. Still, the backlash forced tech giants like Google and Facebook to do something. Facebook is now partnering with fact-checking organizations like Snopes and PolitiFact to flag articles that present deliberately misleading content. Google now cuts off AdSense revenue to sites with spoof domains like NewYorkTimesPolitics.com. But that's still flagging fake news after it's been published and shared. So tech companies like Moat propose combining algorithms with human insight to catch fake news before it spreads. Okay, so It looks like this is still happening today. Uh, so a company called the Global Disinformation Index has several primers on how disinformation works in the news ecosystem. We can see that profiting from disinformation is still happening in 2020 and the sums of money are larger. Ad services on nearly 200 sites are making $1 million a month in ad revenues from electoral disinformation content. Here is an example from GDI. They have labeled this article as electoral disinformation. And in the lower right corner, there is an advertisement for amazon.com. That's showing that major companies sometimes inadvertently fund disinformation. And here's another example. CBS.com here um, is advertising on the deceptive site abcnews.com.co, which is masquerading as the legitimate news site abcnews.go.com. Um, and we can see that uh, this single domain had netted approximately $500,000 over a six month period, all earned via ad tech companies placing ads on the domain, abcnews.com.co. So that is still happening. Um, and so we have, you know, we may be wondering, well, who else is generating um, all this misinformation? 
And Mariana Spring is a reporter for the BBC, the British Broadcasting Corporation. Um, and we're gonna take a look at her video about who creates viral misinformation. Want to know why coronavirus started? Or what might cure it? Well, search online and you'll find thousands of answers, many of which aren't true. I investigate disinformation from the BBC, and I'm often asked, who starts these rumours and who spreads them? Well, as always, the answer isn't straightforward, so I've broken them down into five different types. One, the Joker. Lots of people have been sharing funny posts and memes online. And some of them are pretty good, but others go too far and people actually believe that they're true. Two, the scammer. This lot are looking to make money from the pandemic. Some create fake texts trying to get hold of your bank account details. Or others plug dodgy advice looking to sell their remedies and cures. Three, the politician. The people in charge can also spread fake news. That includes officials and state-sponsored media from around the world. Officials in China and the US have been trading this information since the start of the virus, each accusing the other of deliberately creating it. Of course, neither of them have claimed the truth. And there are concerns about foreign interference. That's when states spread misleading information abroad in order to further their own aims. But it can be very difficult to trace interference back to the people in charge, or to figure out who are behind the networks of fake accounts that are pushing misleading information. Four, the conspiracy theorists. These people think that nothing is as it seems. They falsely link 5G to coronavirus, speculating about who created it, or even suggesting that coronavirus doesn't exist at all. None of these are true. These ideas have been bouncing around on the internet for a while, but they've started getting more attention as worried people look for quick answers to their questions. Five, the insider. There's information that apparently comes from someone we trust, an unnamed doctor, professor, or hospital worker. But it turns out they don't exist. Or if they do, it seems to be a game of Chinese whispers gone wrong. And this misinformation goes viral because it's shared, often by a relative in your WhatsApp group who passes it on just in case, or by a celebrity who amplifies it to get thousands of followers. Tech companies, media regulators, and governments decide what happens when people start and spread misinformation. But ultimately, we're all responsible for stopping its spread. Check out our top tips for spotting and stopping misleading stuff online. And think before you share. So, why do we believe and share disinformation? Well, disinformation um, appeals to our emotions. And so if you're feeling anger and, or sadness or happiness, you're, it's harder to, to think clearly. Um, and so one thing we can do is step back and, and, and just take a breath and try to reconnect with our reasoning um, because that will often stop disinformation um, from spreading and from us from believing it. So another thing that happens is that disinformation has a patina of credibility, uh, a kernel of truth, and it just seems somehow plausible to us. So it's not just this shouting at us that it's not true. It can just be misleading sometimes and very difficult to discern. Three, bots. Um, so bots are fake social media accounts run by computers. They're used to trick algorithms into believing that someone or some item is popular by creating fake shares, likes, and comments. And when we see that something has had a lot of engagements, we are enticed to join the crowd. Another, the fourth um, on this list is the illusory truth effect. And that is something that's been studied. Um, human beings tend to um, uh, behave this way. And that is that the more we encounter something, the more we believe it. And that leads to the possibility that every time a lie is repeated, 
it appears slightly more plausible. And lastly, we have we bring our own biases to what we're reading. So confirmation bias, um, when information confirms our view, we tend to believe it. Um, and so that is, those are the, you know, mechanisms at work. So um, this, uh, this comic shows us, I'm sure we've all done this. We've um, read something or we've heard things and we want to check it out. And so we go to the internet and we literally, the very first thing we find that um, confirms what we already believe, we stop and we're satisfied. So that is our confirmation bias at work. Um, and we have these filter bubbles. Um, and the way that works is that algorithm, algorithms reflect our choices back into what we see on the internet. So algorithms and our confirmation bias work together to create the filter bubble of information that we are exposed to. Uh, when you only read algorithmic feeds, then you are in a filter bubble of your own construction. So you're in, your feed includes the videos you like, the brands you like, uh, the news you like, the facts you like, et cetera. So, and we might have good intentions of seeking out a variety of points of view or resources, but information overload is a reality. There's so much um, published and being thrown at us all the time that can stop us from investigating other points of view or just other resources, resulting in information avoidance. So what can we do um, to, you know, start being better um, uh, consumers of information? So detecting and deciphering. These are some things you can do right away. Step back, take control of your digital experience. Consider your reactions. Take a step back and question, am I, you know, um, interested in this because it, confirms what I think? Is it making me angry? Or do I think that this has something I should share with my friends because I want to connect with them and um, or help them out in some way? Understand the content you see. Understand what you're seeing. Is it news or opinion? Is it responsible journalism? And then verifying and fact checking and also reverse image searching, which are techniques that you can do. And we'll be talking more about those. So this is an electronic book that I want to show you. We're going to go to the site. It's a free ebook um, and web literacy for student fact checkers. So we're going to leave the PowerPoint again for a moment. And so this book um, gives you all kinds of strategies and in a, a very succinct manner. Um, I'm going to show you the, these four moves are really helpful when you're uh, looking at information, especially online. So, and you can do this in sequential order or in whatever order makes sense for you. Um, you can check for previous work, look around to see if someone else has already fact checked the claim or provided a synthesis of research. Go upstream to the source. So if you see an art, and you're reading something and it says that uh, the original, it mentions the original study or document, you should go back to that original source and read it. Um, once you've read that, you should um, check and against other, um, you know, uh, experts or other, what other people are saying. Um, and you can check out the author of that um, original work um, and also you know, look at critiques of, of the publication itself. So it helps to get other points of view. And one thing you can do when you're online is just think about leaving that original source instead of staying focused on it to immediately start checking out the other opinions. So you might have open tabs um, on, on your um, computer so you can just quickly be checking other sources. If you get stuck, um, you can uh, circle back, you know, and start at whatever point. It may not be a, a you know linear process. You might have to go back 
and, and you know, retrace your steps, etc. And you might not have to do all four of these moves to feel confident that you've checked out a, a, a resource. Um, if you find success at any stage, your work might be done, as Mike Caulfield, the author of this book, says. So this is a really great book. I recommend it. It's, as I said, it's succinct, but it's very comprehensive and it gives you lots of tips. So when, when you see, he says um, fact check, well, he shows you how you can do a search um, on specific fact checking sites and including keywords from what you're looking at. So it gives you really good tips as well as um, and a good overview of the topic. So I highly recommend this. Okay, so speaking of fact-checking sites, here are a few very reputable fact-checking sites. Um, and they all uh, are transparent in their process and methodology for how they investigate claims um, and come to decisions about whether a claim is true or false or partially true, et cetera. Um, and so you could go to any of these and feel confident that you were seeing um, you know, uh, a good um, instruction on whether something was reliable. Um, I'm going to go to factcheck.org uh, and we'll just leave this screen again. So, factcheck. So, this um, is one of the fact checking sites. It's a project of the Annenberg Public Policy uh, Center. They have an about us, so you can see their process here. Um, and they just, um, are talking about current um, or recent uh, claims that have been investigated with their, and then they weigh in on those and make decisions. They sh they're sharing their decisions. They also have a couple of subject areas they're focusing on, coronavirus and side check. They have a partnership with Facebook um, so that they're communicating with each other about um, their findings. And um, so this is, you can also um, ask questions of this site. So it's a really um, useful fact checking site and you do have the capacity to search for specific topics to see if they've been addressed in, in, in factcheck.org. And so I would suggest too that you should feel free to try more than one fact checking site and you know compare how they do what their process is and what they what their final um, analysis is as well. Okay, so let's go back to our PowerPoint. And the Washington Post um, reported recently that both Facebook and Twitter, have recently updated policies that they hope will limit the rapid spread of disinformation around the election. This article also notes similar um, measures being taken by Google and TikTok. And I just wanna point out a couple here, a couple of examples. Facebook and Instagram will show a notification that says votes are still being counted or too early to call until Reuters and the national election pool declare races. Um, and Twitter has stated that if a candidate prematurely declares victory, it will label and possibly remove their posts. So um, unlike an article that makes a lot of claims, a meme has one or two pictures and a little bit of text. So memes require a different strategy to parse and contextualize in order to understand what they are trying to imply. So here we have a framework or a set of questions for analyzing memes. Um, what is the point it is trying to make? And is it factually correct? Is anything mischaracterized? Are there gross generalizations? Is there, are there exaggerations or hyperbole? Um, does it seem fair what is being depicted in that meme? Um, so those are questions. And then this one really can be helpful because a lot of context is often missing from a meme just by 
uh, definition, they don't have a lot of text describing what is happening. So if you can ask about what you think might be missing um, or what would fill in your the gap in knowledge for you to understand that, um, that is a good uh, set of uh, approaches to unpacking memes. And we have a, an example of deconstructing some image-based information here from the News Literary Pro Literacy excuse me, Project. Um, and so we're gonna take a look at it. It's the SIFT, which is, appears in a um, newsletter. Oops, excuse me. Um, I'm going to a website. So again, Okay, so um, on Friday, October 16th, 2020, President Donald Trump held a campaign rally in Ocala, Florida. Later that day, someone posted a photo of a large crowd to Facebook and claimed it was the Ocala rally. But was it? Let's find out. So here is um, a uh, Facebook um, account but this started as a tweet. And um, note that this image is a screenshot of a photo originally shared on Twitter. And the tweet that accompanied the photo was Ocala, Trump rally, um, and exclamation points. So there, Anthony is identifying this photo as being a part of the Trump rally in Ocala. Um, and we can, um, let's see, is this photo uh, of a rally for President Donald Trump in Ocala, Florida? Well, if we look at the comments within this Facebook um, page, we can see some people are agreeing with, um, with the assertion uh, that Anthony's making. But as we look down, we see there's something here that says, this picture was taken in Zurich in 2018 during the street parade. And then um, we have another person saying, wow, and then doesn't look like the Ocala I have been to. I don't remember the old European construction. So there's already discussion here about, um, you know, whether this is a an accurate depiction of the location. And, but we can also see that this has been flagged by one of Facebook's fact-checking partners. So notice here it says, see notice. And if we were to read that, it would tell us about the accuracy of this claim. Um, but, um, or we could go through this whole set of um, steps, which would lead us to the conclusion that this was indeed a photo from Zurich. And so I just wanted to show you this because there are ways to decipher what you're seeing. And it's very helpful too when um, you have a, a Facebook fact checking um, notice. Um, but what actually happened here was there was a Reuters um, post that, uh, that ascertained the, the location as well. So Reuters is a major news service. And as we know, that's on the, it was high on our reliability chart. So, there, um, there are ways to uh, decipher these things. Let me go back to um, our PowerPoint. And so unfortunately, we now may encounter sophisticated disinformation in the form of manipulated media. So not just photos um, with uh, mislabeled mislabeling text um, or misattributions, but actual manipulation of the media itself. Reuters has teamed up with Facebook to create a free course on identifying and tack tackling manipulated media. And this is from the curriculum there. How can media be manipulated? Um, identifying deep fakes. And, um, you know, this is a, you know, this is a really good um, curriculum. And these are not images of real models. They are artificial faces. Uh, they look real, but they're artificial. 
Um, they've been generated using deep learning technology. So um, deep fakes can be used to create false identities. Uh, so um, the Reuters website also has examples of fake uh, video that I encourage you to take a look at. So let's look at another type of tricky disinformation, conspiracy theories. This tool was presented by Vanessa Otero at a recent media literacy workshop that I attended. Um, and this set of questions is particularly suited to unpacking rhetoric that is common conspiracy theories. So eight ways that critical thinkers know when a news story is unreliable, disreputable, or embarrassing to share. So red flag one, it explicitly states that it is telling the truth and or everyone else is lying to you. Well, your logic should tell you if they have to preface it by swearing, it's true, it's probably not. So if they're saying, we know the truth, this is definitely true, you, you should have a red flag going up. Um, uh, red flag two, it contains short, conclusory opinion statements. No one has proven that the government wasn't involved. They say it was X, but how do you know it wasn't Y? Real journalists typically don't write like this. Red flag three, it is organized as a list of questions or hypotheses. Why wasn't this, it doesn't add up that, it's really unlikely that X happened. This is literally the opposite of news, which is answers, not questions. Um, and red flag four, it puts the burden on you to answer the questions. If you can't answer these questions, um, do you really know what happened? Uh, hey, I thought you were supposed to be the journalist here. So red flag five, it asks you to prove a negative, which is often impossible. Six, it suggests an insidious plot by someone, media, elites, corporations, government, but it doesn't say exactly what the plot is or provide any evidence for it. Um, no one knows how deep this goes, for example. Number seven, elevates the credibility of one expert who goes the cons against the consensus of their entire expert peer group. So one scientist versus all the other scientists. Um, and, you know, that is definitely suspect. If one out of a thousand doctors says one thing contrary to 999, the 999 likely didn't get together in order to trick you. And then the last claim, um, the last red flag claims that being taken down for promoting misinformation is censorship which therefore improves that the item taken down is actually true. So just as we expected, they removed it because it's true. Well, there is no reason why something widely debunked, taken down, could enhance credibility. That does not, is not logical. So um, this is a great checklist for analyzing news about protest and it has information that really is share, they're sharing here. This is the onthemedia.org um, set of uh, checklists and they're sharing their experience about what happens with news in this particular um, topic area. So for protests, TV news will fixate on incidences of violence, even if rare and uncharacteristic of the overall event. Um, opponents will try to delegitimize protesters by claiming they are paid or otherwise dishonest. This is almost always untrue. Measuring crowd size is an imprecise politicized enterprise. Be skeptical of hard numbers. View aerial photos and compare sources. So for this topic, um, there are practices that are more relevant. Um, they're, they're more general principles of how um, these things are reported. And um, it's helpful to see that. There's also a fake news edition, which gives you a set of checklists and, or red flags to be aware of. All caps, um, Photoshop pictures, clickbait, 
um, and gives you advice to follow links. And if the links are garbage, then it, or if the site is garbage, it will probably link you to worse garbage, or there may be a mismatch between what they're linking you to and what you find. Um, read past headlines. So these are all tips. And if you, you know, maybe have these types of checklists with you as you're um, reading news. Um, you will get more familiar. It, you know, it'll become more of a practice for you to ask these types of questions or to, to look out for these red flags um, or to just um, follow the practices of um, investigating. So I think that they can be very helpful. And then how to spot fake news. This is just another checklist. Um, consider the source, check the author, check the date, check your biases, read beyond the headlines, um, supporting sources. Is it a joke or so is it a satire? Um, and we, I think we can all be tricked by this at times. Um, so be careful about that. And then be sure you're asking or consulting fact-checking sites and also asking librarians. So um, we librarians, um, are we are knowledgeable about credibility and credible resources and we have access and so do you as students to um, large collections of credible resources on news and other subjects and so we are here to help guide you and to um, make suggestions for you in choosing resources and how you can choose your resources. We actually have on our website an Ask a Librarian button. Um, and so uh, the library URL is, um, if you just go to smc.edu forward slash library, you'll get to the library website and you'll see some of our resources. But please think of us as you know, a resource as well. We are here to help you and we can do that in real time. We can even set up Zoom meetings with you so that we can show you resources um, and work with you on your research. Now, some of you may be taking this workshop for credit. Um, if your instructor said you could get credit or suggested you um, uh, watch this webinar. The code word you need to provide your instructor with is journalism. And so that is the word of the day. And I'll let you take a moment to note that. Um, and lastly, we've got a fun game for you to try your skills at detecting misinformation. And I'll put the link in the chat. Uh, let me just see here. Just a moment. Okay. That's the link to the game. And then the library website, if you go to smc.edu forward slash library, that will take you to the library. Oh, you know what? I should make it a link. Oh, the link is rather long, but if you just type in smc.edu forward slash library, you will get to the, um, the library page. So um, I'm wondering if there are any questions. And actually, I can show you the library page. Um, just see here. So uh, smc.edu library. And 
here's that Ask a Librarian link. And if you select that, you can um, send us your questions and we will work with you on making sure you're finding the information you need. Um, also, we do have databases which include credible um, news sources. And if you go to our databases and then select all databases, there are multiple um, news sources, including the Corsair archive, so our SMC newspaper, um, and the um, newspaper Source Plus, which is full text for many US and international newspapers, and then a really excellent US news stream, um, which includes the major uh, newspapers of record, the Los Angeles Times, New York Times, Washington Post, Wall Street Journal, um, it, for example. And so you do have and many, many more. So you have access to lots of excellent news sources not to mention in all of the various uh, other periodicals that we subscribe to. So um, are there any questions? Um, let's see, I don't see anything in the chat. And um, it seems that, let me go ahead and close this. Well, I, I just want to thank you um, for for attending. And I hope that this will help get you thinking about, um, you know, how to evaluate news information and, and hopefully give you a better understanding of sort of the landscape of, of how news is um, made and shared. And um, thank you for attending. Have a great day and take care. I'm going to stop sharing. And um, again, thanks and have a great day, everyone. Bye-bye. I'm going to end this meeting now.